Just after five minutes past one o'clock on 5AA, well, we're moving on to the topic of multiple sclerosis. It's an issue that uh, is one that demands a lot of research and obviously a lot of money to make that research happen. There are people all over the world tackling it, including here at uh, Flinders Uni, where the SA Brain Bank has been set up. And co-director of that is Associate Professor Mark Slee, and he is in the studio uh, with me. Mark, good afternoon to you. Thank you very much, Matthew. And you've brought in one of your patients, uh, Liz Calvo, who uh, has been diagnosed now for for some years with MS. Liz, hello. Hi, how are you going? Welcome. Good, thank you. Well, let's start with you, Mark. MS, just describe what it is briefly and and what the prognosis is for people who are uh, diagnosed. Uh, Certainly. Um, Multiple sclerosis is a a disorder of the the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, and it's caused uh, by a person's immune system attacking itself uh, and the brain becomes inflamed over time and people have bouts of uh, or attacks of problems uh, such as loss of vision or loss of coordination or movement uh, that for most people with multiple sclerosis get better over time as the attack resolves. But over many years, usually people accumulate quite significant disability. Until the last 10 years or so, we've not really had very effective treatments for it, but the landscape has changed considerably just in the last few years, and we've got a range of very effective treatments to try and quieten the disease down, Mm. but we still can't cure it, and our understanding of it uh, is still very incomplete. And so uh, uh, Liz is part of a a group of... um, patients that we have at Flinders and other neurologists manage around uh, Adelaide uh, with with the disease that um, requires quite significant treatment and monitoring. But there's still a lot of unanswered questions about the disease. It sounds though, from what you say over the last 10 years, it's come along in leaps and bounds of research for it. How far away would you would you care to say, how, how if, if a cure is on the horizon at least? Um, uh, there was, uh, years ago, there was little light at the end of the tunnel, but now the light is clearly there. In terms of curing the disease, uh, it's, a, it's a mammoth task. Mm. Um, we're really looking at the moment at uh, really effectively controlling the disease so people can live very productive lives for most of their adult life. Mm. Um, there is the potential for preventing the disease in people who have a susceptibility to developing it. Yeah. Um, how do you know who they are? Uh, it's a complex disease that's uh, the determinants of which are part genetic, uh, but mainly environmental uh, factors, associations like vitamin D insufficiency, sunlight exposure, uh, exposure to different um, uh, community viruses mm. that alter one's immune system that then favours the development of the disease. Okay. Liz, let me ask you, I mean, it must be quite terrible to realise or to be told that you have an incurable disease. Ah, uh, yeah, it certainly wasn't fun. Mm. Um, I was pregnant with my third child at the time, so things were very stressful. So I already had two and was running around after them and everything. So it was not, yeah, so to be told that and, and certainly not having had any um, signs or symptoms of it, of it at all until it actually happened, it was really very difficult um, to go through and it's certainly not something that I would um, wish on anybody. Yeah, yeah. And what is the future for you? Um, well, the future was fairly, I guess, bleak. Or not, I'll say bleak, but, you know, it wasn't as um, as rosy as, as, as it is now. Mm-hmm. Like now there is certainly more treatments available than there were when I was first diagnosed, um, but we're certainly not there yet. You know, um, we certainly are not on the horizon too much, I think, of of a cure, but certainly better treatments and things are becoming available. So I'm hoping that the future is is quite good. So the prognosis potentially is for essentially a long productive life ahead? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would, that's what keeps me going, that I can you know, think of the fact that I'm going to have a nice productive life and going to be able to look after my kids and my grandkids and do all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. So you, you've got three, 14 through to nine, is that right? Yeah, 14, 13, nine. Wow, so nine years ago, obviously, you were diagnosed. And what you were mm-hmm. saying, Mark, that, you know, we've come along in those nine years tremendously. So, you know, it's a horrible thing to even think, but perhaps 
your diagnosis came at essentially the right time. If, if you're going to get it, it's probably now. It's, well, it's a good you know time. what? I actually did have a neurologist, not Mark, but yeah. a different a different neurologist who actually said to me once that um, it was a very exciting time mm. to have MS, which was yeah, you know, no, that's not how I mean it. No, but, no, no. Yeah. I know that's not how yeah. you mean it, but I was. I think it was very. He was lucky that he said that to me because yeah. I'm, I'm a pretty easygoing person. But yeah. I think what he meant was that you know mm. there was mu- there are much better treatments and things available, which mm. certainly the uh, the uh, brain bank help contribute towards. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Let's talk about the brain bank, Nick. So how how does it work? Is it essentially a research lab? Is that what we're talking about here? Um, it's housed in a research setting, uh, but it's a it's a uh, resource of uh, human tissue uh, that has been uh, collected and curated. Uh, through a donor program over the last 30 years. It's one of the oldest uh, human tissue banks uh, around. Mm. Uh, And people with neurological disease, now we're talking about multiple sclerosis as an exemplar, but um, the brain bank contains principally people who have passed due to Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, Mm. motor neuron disease. Uh, who have uh, bequeathed their tissue to the the South Australian Brain Bank. Mm. Now, when a person passes, uh, we get notified and we work with the families and the funeral directors and other groups uh, to uh, fulfil that person's wish for donation. Uh, And that donation comes to us at Flinders, but we work very closely with other uh, collaborators, principally uh, the neuropathology group at the University of Adelaide. So Professor Blumberg's there is the the neuropathologist, Mm. and his group um, uh, characterised the tissue so that we know exactly what's going on. And then the tissue is stored, and then researchers can then apply to us uh, for us to share that tissue uh, for their research. From all over the world, presumably. We, we have had calls on the tissue from all over the world, but it, we, it's principally to support research within South Australia and nationally. Um, and so it's quite an active national uh, bank. It needs money to operate, no doubt, and you do have a Christmas appeal running for it. Yeah, the, uh, we're very grateful for the Flinders Foundation to be supporting us as their Christmas appeal this year. Um, entities like the South Australian Brain Bank require creative sources for, for funding, and so we're uh, uh, you know, leveraging the help of the Flinders Foundation uh, to raise awareness about the existence of the Brain Bank and inviting people, should they wish to, uh, to provide a, a donation this Christmas uh, in terms of uh, supporting us with funding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of um, people with illnesses who might want to become involved in some way, how how can that happen? Mm. Can can people, apart from, you know, they might not be in a position to donate financially, Certainly. can anyone else get involved in, in some other way there? Uh, people can uh, contact us through the uh, Centre for Neuroscience at the Flinders University. Mm-hmm. They can... Uh, uh, find out more about the donor program and quite often we have a person who has a neurological disease like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease and that person and their their spouse or next of kin or family then register as part of our donor program mm. and so we've got many people on our on our donor program at the moment um, you, you mention all those other diseases there like um, motor neurone for instance and and all the others that you you ran through it's almost depressing, isn't it, when you, you think about all these things that can afflict human beings that we just don't have an answer to. Mm-hmm. And obviously the the work you're doing is, is trying to uncover that. But it must take, you know, gifted researchers clearly and uh, a united approach from all a- across the yes, globe to yes. try and get breakthroughs. And they're happening slowly, slowly, but... Yes, yep. that's right. And I think it speaks to the complexity of the nervous system and the mm-hmm. complexity of disease. Um uh, these are these are very difficult diseases to intervene with meaningfully once a disease process has begun. Uh, now that being said, uh, the the degree of collaboration uh, across basic science mm. to also include clinicians and patient groups is unprecedented and it's growing. And so I think the the future in terms of these uh, diseases is actually uh, quite, I'm quite optimistic that hopefully within my practicing lifetime, things will continue to change dramatically. Mm. And it's the use of uh, well, well curated uh, human tissue supporting research, such as through the brain bank that Mm. we can achieve that. 
Liz, you're, you're making a donation ultimately, the, the ultimate sacrifice, I suppose, at the end of your life. You're, you're making a big donation to the brain bank. Yeah, I've told my family and everybody that um, I would like to donate my brain and my spinal cord to the brain bank um, when I do pass. Um, basically because I, um, before I was um, diagnosed with MS, I was very much a um, supporter of um, organ donation. So um, I wanted to do that and I used to donate my blood every 10 weeks and um, I couldn't do that anymore once I was diagnosed so I needed to find some way that I could um, help mm. and that was how I found it. So yeah. yeah, I'm on the register so when I do pass, which hopefully isn't any time soon. No, another 50, <laughs> no, no. 50 plus years. Um, yes, if I have anything have to do it. with it. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, okay. Well, that is that is really good. So, people can do. Can can healthy people do that? People yes, absolutely. Yeah. And so, what we often see is that um, a person, uh, a spouse, or a family member of a oh, person yeah. who has a neurological disease reg co-registers, mm. uh, and and the people normal uh, healthy individuals uh, are incredibly valuable for mm. uh, resources like the brain bank. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. Liz, I can't imagine, you know, the cold shiver you must get when you're given news like this and, and mm. the, the way you, you know, you just physically would fall apart, let alone mentally going forward from there. Yeah. But how difficult was it dealing with the diagnosis and then telling your family and, and the kids especially? Um, it was hard. Um, the kids are obviously um, quite a bit younger, but I've been very open with, with the kids from the word go and obviously... Um, gave them the information that suited the, the, the age that they were at, but they were all very um, knowledgeable about everything at the moment. Um, so, yeah, it was really hard at the time. I had my four-year-old, my middle son, crawling around on the floor of the mm. doctor's office, and I actually really didn't think that that would be the, the diagnosis. It had been um, sort of um, thrown thrown in there, but it was not something that I actually even thought thought, mm. you know. And um, so he was crawling around on the floor, and you know I was sitting there, and the doctor just said, "Yes, yes, you do have you do have MS," and I just fell apart mm. pretty much right there in the doctor's office. It was really it was awful. Yeah, it was awful because it was not something I, I thought this is all too much for me to handle. I can't do this, mm. you know, and I'd, I'd gone away and my mum was like, do you want me to come with you? And I, I went, oh, no, no, everything's fine. And mm. then, of course, I was like, oh, my God, I wish my mum had come with yeah. me. Um, but, yeah, so I I kind of had to pick myself up and go out to the car and basically sit there and process things for yeah. a bit. Um, but so obviously things have have. I say things have got a lot better since then, as in I can I'm emotionally and mentally handle all of that a lot better than I obviously yeah. at the beginning, which would be the same for um, everyone else as well. So, What symptoms um, had you had that made you, um, I guess, be concerned enough to try and find out what was wrong? Well, I started off with um, a really sore eye, okay. which they which is called optic neuritis, um, which I didn't wasn't aware of at the time. And it was really, really sore. So, and it was basically like that for about three weeks. And then I started to have some numbness in my left hand, which in um, it progressed all the way up my arm um, to to basically right up to the side of my face. Mm. And because um, I was pregnant, and obviously when you're pregnant, you can have blood pressure yeah. problems that um, exhibit the similar symptoms. So I saw my obstetri obstetrician, and he took my blood pressure, everything was fine. And he mm. said, I think your problem is, is neurological. Mm. And so, yeah, they got me in to see a neurologist who sent me for an MRI, which was interesting, a seven-month pregnant woman in the MRI machine. Oh, yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, so, and I think the results there were that there certainly were signs of MS, but I think the distribution of the inflamed areas that I had at the time were... Um, very were not typical mm. of MS, which is why I had just thrown that mm. diagnosis aside, and I had, didn't think of it at that time. But. Yeah, wow. Mark, is there a, a number or a contact or an email, a website that people can look up more information? Certainly, yeah. certainly Matthew. I think the easiest thing uh, would be for people to visit the uh, Flinders Foundation website, mm -hmm. and they'll see Liz. 
and her family um, right on the on the front of the website there, and then they can click on the links through the Flinders Foundation website and get to uh, any uh, to the donor program and uh, to for donations. Okay, fantastic, Associate Professor Mark Lee. Thank you so much for your time today, and um, thank you, Matthew. Liz. Just fabulous, fabulous having you in. Your positive uh, attitude is is really good, obviously, and that must be a good part of it too, in terms of keeping keeping the, the fight going, and obviously not to again sound horrible, but that neurologist. I mean, you. What he said to you initially about there's never yeah. been a better time. I mean, you know, as horrible as it is, he's probably right you in terms what? of where he, he we was. are. He was yeah. right. Um, and I think he knew that he could say it to someone like mm. me because I was, I'm quite mm. a positive person. Yeah. So, yeah. And I, everything is looking, uh, everything's looking up. Yep. But obviously we need to, um, we need, well, we need money so mm. that we can continue the fantastic research that's going on. Indeed. Well, thank you for coming in and, and good luck going forward. No worries. Thank, thank you, you very much.